have on the law since lockdown. It would be easy to forget that while we've all been at home baking banana bread and dismantling statues or indeed the police, uh, the High Courts have continued to carry on uh, making decisions and determining cases which are important to the clients that we represent and um, important to us as housing practitioners. So David Cowan will look first at developments on the law of possession and Zia Nabi will then speak about uh, developments in homelessness. Finally, we have Sue Baxter, doyen of supported housing, who will talk about the pandemic and, and how supported housing has been, has been affected by that. Now, Sue, as some of you will know, is a well-respected expert in the field of uh, improving quality of housing management uh, and, uh, and in supported housing. And she is the co-author of <coughs> LAG's upcoming book, Supported Housing and the Law, uh, which is due for an update uh, next year. Now, for those of you who are new to Zoom and who haven't attended one of our webinars before, you will notice that your mics are muted and your videos are off. That is a pre-setting, so don't be alarmed by that. Um, that's just so that everybody can uh, concentrate on our speakers. Um, you will still be able to ask questions and you'll see that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Um, we're asking that you use that instead of the chat function uh, or the raise hand function. Um, so panelists will try and deal with as many questions and answers as possible. Um, and if we don't have time for all of them, please do feel free to send us an email afterwards and we'll try and deal with them by email. Um, we are recording this session. So uh, a copy of this and the slides will be available after for you or for any of your colleagues who have been unable to attend. So without further ado, I will hand over to David Cowan. Hi, thank you very much for joining us in this sort of disembodied uh, webinar. Um, and uh, as uh, Sarah says, I'm talking about um, possession. Um, and, um, uh, and essentially, I'm going to talk about three particular elements. First of all, possession and the PSED, um, the Public Sector Equality Duty. Secondly, ending flexible tenancies. And thirdly, if I have time, uh, a brief update on what's been going on around private renting. Um, uh, so uh, possession and the PSED. Well, uh, just let's start with where we were before uh, as lockdown commenced. Uh, there are three particular uh, things that we need to remember. The first is that um, even where the PSED has been breached, court has a general discretion to re refuse relief if the outcome is highly likely to have been the same. That comes from Forward and Aldwick. Um, uh, secondly, um, and this is, uh, I suppose, prospective, um, uh, where where there's been no change in the occupier's circumstances and those circumstances have already been considered uh, as part of the, uh, the original claim, um, uh, then essentially the landlord can seek to enforce the possession order uh, uh, where they've made further inquiries and they are, um, uh, and nothing has been, uh, nothing further has been disclosed to them. They don't need to reconsider the PSED at that stage. And that's Powell. Um, and thirdly, uh, a defect in consideration of the PSED at one stage can be remedied subsequently. And that's Barnsley and Norton. So uh, what we have in Luton Community Housing and Derdana, which is um, uh, the most recent uh, decision on the effect of PSED in um, uh, possession claims. Uh, yeah, possession proceedings brought on the basis of ground 17, various false statements were found to have been made by the Durdana household that enabled them to uh, uh, obtain an allocation of that accommodation. I think there's no doubt, it, it, essentially, that the claimants were in breach of the PSED. 
they'd, they'd done what they claimed was an, uh, uh, an EA assessment after service of the NOSP and the, and the claim had been begun. Um, uh, but in fact, the assessment didn't consider the impact of Ms. Dadana and her daughter's conditions on them. Um, and uh, in, uh, in the county court, Her Honour Judge Bloom dismissed the claim. And uh, um, she also held that if, even if she had made the, the, the possession order, um, uh, and uh, so that to give Luton uh, the opportunity to consider the PSED subsequently, then that wouldn't have been appropriate because they wouldn't have approached the evaluation with the requisite open mind. I think that was quite an interesting thing um, there. Um, now, in Durdana, uh, uh, Lord Justice Patton makes a couple of comments, I, I, and I think these, these comments are, are, are particularly interesting. Partly the first of them, I think, is, is unlikely to survive. But, but what he says is that although it's theoretically possible for the duty to be um, uh, uh, complied with in ignorance of what it consists of, such cases are likely to be rare, and this is not one of them. So um, uh, that is uh, uh, kind of interesting uh, as, a, as a starting point, it seems to be in conflict certainly with HOTAC. Uh, and then he goes on to say um, that although the reasonableness uh, uh, or proportionality of continuing to seek possession may be an appropriate way of characterizing the ultimate decision to be made, I think that Mr. Van Hegen is right to submit that the decision needed to be preceded by more than a proportionality assessment. And that what, what the housing officer should have carried out was the open-minded conscientious inquiry referred to in the authorities. So, so again, that's interesting guidance there. Um, now, what, uh, what the Court of Appeal hold is, is very clearly that the judge had uh, misdirected herself. So even though, uh, even though the equality assessment had not been done properly, what uh, Her Honour Judge Bloom had asked was, uh, if, if uh, Luton had um, uh, done, the, uh, done the proper uh, decision, would, uh, done, done the proper PSED uh, decision, would it have been inevitable that they would have gone for possession? And that was said to be the wrong test. And the correct test is said to be that it has to be highly likely. So uh, as in the test in judicial review, if the decision would be highly likely to have been the same. Um, and the correct approach is, is to ask what would the decision maker have decided had it acted in accordance with section 149. And here the court's task is to form an objective view based on the material available to the judge. Um, and the court held that it was highly likely in this case that, uh, that the uh, Luton would have uh, continued with the possession claim because this was not a case where the medical evidence established that the uh, effect on Ms. Dadana and her daughter would have been either acute or disproportionate. There's one little point uh, uh, that I just wanted to add to that. Um, it was one of the one of the submissions that was made was was whether it's appropriate for a judge to adjourn a matter to enable the PSED properly to be considered. Uh, and there's no comment on that in uh, by the Court of Appeal in this case um, because it was hypothetical. But that one may come back. Um, uh, Hertfordshire and Davis have put under PSED. Um, it's really a case about uh, the enforcement of uh, a, a High Court possession order. Um, and uh, enforcement by the High Court comes under CPR 83.13. Um, and uh, permission of the court is required. So you have to make an application. Um, and um, 83.13.8 says that every person in actual occupation, in actual possession of the whole or any part of the land, 
must have received such notice of the proceedings as appears to the court sufficient to enable the occupant to apply to the court for any relief to which the occupant may be entitled. Now here what happened um, uh, in part was that the claimant made an enforcement application without serving a copy of that enforcement application on uh, the Davis household or indeed uh, Mr. Davis at all. Um, now what, uh, what was said uh, by Master Sullivan in this case is that there is no requirement on the claimant actually to serve the application um, on, the, on uh, the defendant or other occupiers. But on the other hand, mere knowledge that there's been a possession order is insufficient and the proceedings um, uh, in what was meant by the proceedings in 83.13.8 is the whole proceedings. So um, some notice uh, of the application to enforce was required. Uh, the claimant hadn't done it in this case, um, but that did not invalidate the enforcement because essentially they were able to get relief under CPR 3.10. Um, I'm just going to move on from that case to the really important case of uh, Croydon, London Borough Council and Kalunga, which is the ending of flexible tenancies. You'll remember that flexible tenancies are capable of being granted by local authorities under the uh, Localism Act 2011 and also uh, housing associations are able to grant um, affordable tenancies. This is a, a question about whether Croydon could enforce the flexible tenancy, which was a fixed term tenancy of five years, whether they could enforce that, uh, 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 whether they could bring a possession claim within that term of five years. And essentially, Ms. Kalonga had run out rent arrears and uh, uh, antisocial behaviour was alleged. This is a really important case, actually, because apparently around 30,000 flexible tenancies have been granted. Croydon itself has granted 2,400 and many flexible tenancies do not contain a uh, provision for re-entry or a forfeiture clause um, in, the event of breach of, uh, in the event of a breach of covenant. Um, and uh, the ameliorator provisions in the 2016 Act, um, the Housing Planning Act, have not been brought into force. Um, so this remains a really big question. Um, Croydon did not have an explicit, an express uh, forfeiture clause. They claimed, however, that, that essentially they did have a forfeiture clause through their terms and conditions. But it was held by um, uh, Mrs. Justice Tipples, um, who's a fantastic property lawyer, I think. She's a really outstanding property lawyer. Um, uh, she held that uh, uh, those clauses did not meet the fundamental requirement that uh, a forfeiture clause should bring the lease to an end earlier than the natural termination date. So the next question then was whether this was a tenancy for a term certain, but subject to um, termination by the landlord, that is to say, during the fixed term. Um, under section 821b, because if it was, then it could be brought to an end in the usual way of secure tenancies. The, um, uh, um, but what uh, uh, Ms. Justice Tipples held was that that, uh, that set of subsection only applies where the landlord can bring the tenancy to an end prior to expiry of the fixed term. If the landlord does not have that right, then it cannot fall uh, uh, within section 821b and they cannot bring the, uh, the fixed term secure tenancy, flexible tenancy to an end prior to the end of that fixed term. And that is, I think, a really quite important um, uh, uh, judgment. Uh, I, 
fully expect it to, to be appealed. I'm sure it will be, but at the moment, um, it leaves those local authorities, certainly, which have flexible tenancies and no um, express um, or, uh, well, no, well, no right to forfeiture uh, uh, during the fixed term in a degree of difficulty where they are seeking possession. So uh, that will be something to really watch out for after lockdown. Um, and once PD51Z is um, uh, superseded. Um, so, and Ms. Justice Tipples also held that if there is a forfeiture clause, then there is no requirement to serve a section 146 notice during the fixed term. You can just bring the, bring the agreement to end in the normal way for an ordinary secure fixed term tenancy. And again, I think that must be right. Um, uh, there's, uh, she does make the point in her judgment that, uh, and it, it, it wasn't argued, but uh, that a contractual break clause can have the same effect as a forfeiture uh, clause, provided that it does not affect, uh, that break clause does not affect the minimum term required um, in the Act, which is two years. Croydon's uh, uh, flexible tenancies are all five years. So that I think is a really important judgment. Um, uh, finally, just on private tenancies, there is a new form N5B for accelerated possession that a landlord has to uh, complete, um, which came into force from April 2020. I think that, that that form just demonstrates how difficult Section 21 accelerated possession cases are actually uh, are going to be. It's 16 pages long and it is quite complicated to complete and they will get it wrong. I guarantee it. Um, and also um, uh, a couple of things to note. The Tenant Fees Act 2019 now applies in respect of unlaw all unlawful um, uh, fees uh, levied after 1st of June 2020. So whether whether your uh, tenancy agreement started before or after 1st June 19, uh, 2019. That will be important potentially. Um, uh, and also the uh, Electricity Safety, Electrical Safety Standards SI is now uh, in force for, well, it will be in force from the 1st of July 2020 um, uh, for tenancies granted after that time. And uh, from 1st April 2021, uh, it applies to every existing tenancy. Um, but it does exclude certain tenancies um, and you just need to check because the definitions of the exclusions are different from, say, the Protection from Eviction Act. So hostel is, is, has a different definition in those regs. So, so do check that out. But essentially what landlords have to do is uh, uh, provide a written electrical inspection report every five years on the property. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Zia. Right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, David. I'm going to speak uh, fairly briefly about homelessness uh, law in lockdown. Um, we've only had about 15 minutes, so it's going to be, again, a pretty whistle-stop tour. Uh, let's see if I can get onto the next slide. Yes, I can. So it's going to be a whistle-stop tour, and what I'm going to cover fairly briefly are, firstly, the PSED and vulnerability. There's been a court of appeal case on that. Secondly, suitability, uh, which is doubtless uh, something that is going to be more important as time goes on uh, when people are in unsuitable accommodation. And yet, because of the pandemic, uh, they are not being moved. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to address interim relief. There's been a case on interim relief as to what happens if you're refused permission, uh, urgent relief on the papers, what should you do? Should you renew orally or should you go to the Court of Appeal? Um, 
Then I'm going to look at the scope of appeals under section 204, uh, what is meant by error of law uh, under section 204, is it a narrow interpretation or a wide interpretation? And finally, I'm going to uh, very quickly look at the domestic abuse bill that's going uh, uh, through parliament uh, at the moment, uh, which has some significant uh, proposed changes to the homelessness provisions, including a strict liability priority need for a victim of domestic abuse. So starting off with the public sector equality duty and vulnerability, well, let's just remind ourselves, what is the PSED? In Piretti it said, the PSED is designed to secure the brighter illumination of a person's disability to the extent that it bears upon his rights under other laws. So what it means is that when you're looking at the obligations owed to a person with a protected characteristic such as disability, the PSED is meant to make you focus on the fact of their disability. And that, of course, raises some interesting jurisprudential questions. Is the PSED procedural or is it substantive? Is it a process duty or is it a duty that actually means sometimes there's a duty to achieve a result? And although the courts have frequently said the PSED is not, it doesn't impose a duty to get to a result, the case law doesn't always show that. Anyway. Uh, the PSED, as you all know, was considered by HOTAC, and uh, Lord Newberger said that the PSED is complementary to the assessment of vulnerability. Um, that's a pretty pregnant word, complementary. So, basic points. The PSED is not a freestanding duty. It applies to the way in which a public authority exercises its functions. And as I said, it's not a duty to achieve a result, but a duty to have due regard to achieve the statutory equality goals identified in section 149. Although as you will have seen from cases such as Canon, uh, sometimes it does achieve a result uh, because it allows the courts to interpret uh, legislation in a way that is more favorable to a disabled person than to a, a non-disabled person. So HOTAC, uh, which is the leading case and remains a leading case, uh, what Lord Neuberger said was, you've got to focus very sharply on whether the applicant is under a disability, the extent of the disability, the likely effect of the disability uh, on the applicant if and when homeless, and whether the applicant is as a result vulnerable. So th those are the questions that um, Lord Neuberger identified but he also went on to say that this isn't a question of box ticking a failure to mention the psed will not necessarily vitiate a vulnerability assessment if by looking at the letter uh, benevolently the uh, analysis that hotap recommends take place has effectively been done and conversely a mere recitation of the psed won't save the assessment you can't just pay lip service to the PSED if you haven't actually addressed the relevant questions. So McMahon and Watford Borough Council, which is a recent decision, looked at HOTAC in the context of a priority need appeal. Uh, and what uh, it was said was this, that the HOTAC was, wasn't a four stage test which must be rigidly applied. Um, so I think that must be right. What, what HOTAC does is it advises how a local authority can show that it's had the necessary sharp focus uh, that the PSCD requires, how it's illuminated uh, the relevance of a person's disability. But the, the, you don't need to, in your decision letter, authority doesn't need to uh, pose and address each question explicitly and went on to say that the greater the overlap between the particular statutory duty under consideration and the PSED, the more likely it is that performing the statutory duty, the authority will also have complied with the PSED, even if it's not expressly mentioned. And again, arguably that does no more 
then uh, repeat what Lord Newberger said, which is that a, a, a housing officer, a being officer, could comply with the PSED even without being aware of it, as long as the decision letter showed the necessary sharp focus. And of course, it's right that in the vulnerability assessment, there is a substantial overlap. And providing that the reviewing officer appreciates the actual mental or physical problems from which the applicant suffers, uh, the court said, well, the task will then have been properly performed. So that's important, uh, that provided that the reviewing officer appreciates that that appreciation is the illumination uh, that uh, Peretti requires. Now, McMahon is, I've seen uh, in various blogs, that McMahon is uh, being uh, put forward uh, for the proposition that the PCD and vulnerability cases is more or less irrelevant now, because if uh, a local authority is assessing vulnerability, then the PCD is uh, automatically taken care of. And that is not something with, with, with which I agree, because even McMahon itself has the caveat that the providing that the ring officer appreciates the actual mental or physical problems from which the applicant suffers. And of course, as you know, uh, there's a duty to make inquiry, but Crampton Hastings has limited uh, or the sort of challenge that can be brought to uh, a failure to make adequate inquiry in that it's an irrationality challenge. Uh, but then Piretti said, Crampton Hastings must be modified where you've got a protected characteristic in play so that you may, a local authority may need to make an inquiry even if it's not an obvious inquiry that should have been made. So where you have a disabled uh, person, a disabled applicant, uh, there is, in my view, still going to be this point that the inquiry making duty is going to be to the Puretti standard and not to the Cramp and Hastings standard. So that is a, a, a significant difference. The judgment went on to say that a reviewing officer doesn't have to make findings about whether an applicant does or does not have a disability or the precise effect of the PSED. What needs to be considered is an assessment of vulnerability, which is relevant to a person's ability to deal with the consequences of being homeless. But I think if one unpacks that a little bit uh, from, from what it said, so a review officer does not need to make findings about whether an applicant does or does not have a disability. Well, I think that is, uh, that is right, because if a person is disabled, but a reviewing officer makes all necessary inquiry, which takes the fact of the disability into account, then it may be unnecessary to make a finding about whether or not an applicant does or does not have a disability. But what about the situation, which we have seen in reviewing decision letters, where the reviewing officer says, you are not disabled. I've, I've looked at it all, and I don't think you satisfy the protected characteristic test of disability. I think in that particular scenario, it is arguable that given that the test for vulnerability is, is much more demanding, than the benevolent test about whether someone is disabled or not, if a reviewing officer irrationally decides or unlawfully decides that someone is not disabled, that must, in my submission, at the very least, uh, infect the uh, substantive vulnerability decision. And therefore, the finding, a positive finding that a person is not disabled, continues to be significant in my view. Uh, when looking at whether there's any error of law in the priority need decision. And what the, what the officer needs to do is consider how uh, the assessment of vulnerability relevant to a person's ability to deal with the consequences of being homeless. And again, there will have to be, there may very well be a heightened uh, duty of inquiry where disability is in play. For example, what type of accommodation is suitable for a person. And you know, there's some, uh, the court of appeal aren't happy with the PSC being used as a peg on which to hang a highly technical argument. 
and it's not there to set technical traps for conscientious attempts by hard pressuring officers to cover every conceivable issue. And, and but that is right. And I don't think that says anything more than HOTAC, which said that you could comply with the PSED without even being aware that it existed. So it, it's not there to set a trap and it's not there to present highly technical arguments. But in my view, it remains important uh, when you're talking about how the decision is reached and what needs to uh, uh, what needs to be taken into account. Even McMahon accepts that the PACD, even in vulnerability cases, will remain relevant, although the court suggested at a later stage that it may bear on the question of whose case among all those in priority need should be dealt with first. I mean, I'm, so this isn't being talked about in an allocation sense, uh, as far as I can see, but it's being dealt with, it's being talked about under part seven, but it may be relevant, therefore, it is relevant to suitability and may bear on the nature of the accommodation to be offered. So a person who is both vulnerable and disabled will need to have to be provided with accommodation more tailored to their particular needs. So you're illuminating the fact of their disability, but also the PSED in that scenario is having a substantive effect. In addition, uh, said the court, the question of disability may bear on the question whether a person is homeless in the first place, um, i.e. whether it's reasonable for them to continue to occupy their accommodation, for example, because of any disability that they may have. So McMahon is definitely a, a case which means that uh, advisors need to be more careful uh, about how the PSED is argued. But I don't share the view that it effectively means that the PSED has ceased to be of relevance in priority need cases. So going on then to the next part, which is suitability of accommodation. Just very quickly, as you all know, uh, you're not to be treated as having accommodation unless it's accommodation which would be reasonable for a person to continue to occupy. Uh, and then also an authority's duty can only be performed by the securing of suitable accommodation. And these two sections, 1753 and section 206, are in a pretty um, uncomfortable dance, I think, following uh, the Airways and Birmingham City Council. Because a person may be homeless if it's not reasonable to accept, expect him to stay where he is indefinitely or for the foreseeable future. But even though they may be statutorily homeless, that very same accommodation may be suitable for performance for the main housing duty in the short term. So that, that, that same accommodation allows the main housing duty to be performed. In the case of AM and London Borough Newham, the housing, the reviewing officer found that the accommodation was not suitable. But at the judicial review stage, the authorities sought to argue that although it wasn't suitable to, uh, uh, in the long term, it was nonetheless suitable in the short term to enable performance of the main housing duty. And effectively, the judge rejected that this is what the letter meant. So as the reviewing officer was communicating his decision in relation to a request for a suitability review, he must be taken to use his words advisedly when he said, I have concluded that the temporary accommodation provided to you is not suitable. And the court said once accommodation is accepted as not being suitable, then the housing authority is in breach of the main housing duty and couldn't at a later stage say, well, it's still suitable on a short-term basis. I mean, it's right to say that reasonable to continue to occupy and suitable, even though they are two separate terms, are used interchangeably in review decision letters. And therefore, care must be taken to see uh, how suitability is, is being used. I mean, it's not helped to some extent by the fact that in our ways in Birmingham City Council, uh, at a couple of places, the, the terms themselves are used interchangeably. But AM and the number of Neum, I think, is an important case which ties authorities down that when they say something is not suitable, 
they cannot then say, ah, but it's still uh, uh, suitable in the, in the short term. Right. So this is a case about suitability about section uh, 188 one an interim relief so uh, the claimant was a member of the traveler community he had issues with mental health and substance abuse and he applied as homeless and he he wanted accommodation uh, which was self-contained and which was furnished and what the local authority provided was unfurnished accommodation and he challenged that by way of uh, judicial review, saying that, that wasn't suitable for the purpose of Section 1881. And the, uh, uh, the judge refused into relief while holding that the local authority had not acted unlawfully in not providing a fridge, a cooker, and bed when offering unfurnished self contained accommodation. The judge noted that the claimant had been offered several accommodation options, and it was significant that he had originally accepted the unfurnished flat and then sought to challenge suitability. I mean, I think that's a pretty harsh finding because we always tell clients to accept any offer that's made, bearing in mind the gamble that they're taking by not accepting an offer. Um, secondly, it doesn't appear that in reaching this decision, uh, any regard was had to the Equality Act. Anyway, where we are at the moment, is that the Court of Appeal has refu refused permission to appeal the refusal of interim relief, but the admin court is considering whether permission should be granted on the papers. But that was a case very early in lockdown. What happens if interim relief is refused? Where an application for interim relief is refused on the papers by the agent cases judge, how do you renew that application? In the case of Nolson and Stevenage, the claimant sought an urgent oral hearing for the court to reconsider the decision to refuse interim relief under CPR 54.12. And the court held that the court, it didn't have jurisdiction to consider or renew the application for interim relief and that the correct procedure in that situation was to appeal to the Court of Appeal. So they went to the Court of Appeal. And what the court decided was that actually you can apply to have an oral reconsideration of interim relief when it's refused on the papers. Oops, sorry, apologies. So uh, the screen has changed of its own. Uh, let me just go back. I don't know what's happened there. Uh, just bear with me a moment. Uh, I'm not, um, David, if, oh, there we go. Um, thank you. I appear to have lost control of the screen. So what the court said was that in any application where the relevant court form does not ask a specific question, the applicant should generally indicate whether he wishes to be heard orally or whether he is content for the application to be dealt with on the papers alone. Where the court refuses an application on the papers, Unless both parties have consented to it being dealt with on the papers alone, the order should be endorsed with a statement of the right to make an application to have the order set aside, varied or stayed under CPR rule 3.5. And if the parties have consented to a paper determination, however, then the order will be final. And then you have to uh, appeal to the Court of Appeal within 21 days. And any application for an adverse decision made on the papers to be reconsidered at an oral hearing should clearly state that is made under CPR rule 3.35. I think that to cut a long story short, uh, one shouldn't consent to an application being dealt with on the papers alone. You have urgent consideration on the papers. If that is refused, then uh, the applicant retains their uh, opportunity to argue for a renewal of, in, uh, of their application orally and the CPR rule 3.5. David, I wonder if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. I seem to have lost control of the screen. Um, so this is just very quickly on the scope of section 204 appeals. 
this is how wide is a 204 appeal? Is it simply limited to what the issues are in the particular review decision? Or can you change, challenge wider policy issues, such as, for example, contracting out of review decisions? David, I wonder if I can move to the next slide. And what the uh, court said was that it could, the counter court could deal with uh, almost anything that could be dealt with by way of judicial review. It was a broad uh, application of section 204. And in a very small minority of cases, if the court thought it was an issue of general public importance, they could transfer it to the high court, but that it should be slow to do that where it couldn't determine it for itself. Thank you. I wonder if I could have the next slide. Thank you. So very quickly, uh, wrapping up, I think I've, I've run out of time. Domestic abuse and homelessness. Just some statistics there. In October, December 2018, 5,380 households were injured, uh, owed a prevention or relief duty because of domestic abuse. And a further 1,320 were at risk because of other violence or harassment. At the moment, as the law stands, to be in priority need, victims of domestic abuse need to show that they are vulnerable as a result of fleeing violence. So they've got to go through the vulnerability hoo-ha. I wonder if I could have the next slide, please, David. Thank you. And what the domestic abuse bill, which was reintroduced on 3, 3rd of March 2020, by way of amendment does, is that it seeks to introduce a new category of priority need by means of a new section 1891E, I, a, a person who's homeless as a result of that person being a victim of domestic abuse is in priority need. And domestic abuse is broadly defined as abusive behavior from A towards B, where A and B are aged, each age 16 or over and are personally connected to each other. And also abuse can be a single incident or a course of conduct and it includes economic abuse and psychological, emotional or other abuse. So it definitely strengthens the law if this is passed, which hopefully it will be. I think it was debated yesterday. Uh, the amendments were being debated yesterday as to prior to need for victims of domestic abuse. I think I can't, I'm, I've come to an end and that's my last slide. But I just want to add this. We all know that there are lots of rough sleepers being accommodated at the moment who are continuing to be accommodated. At some stage, they're going to be asked to leave. Now, when that happens, it's absolutely imperative that a, the homelessness relief stroke prevention duties have been properly considered and a personal housing plan has been drawn up. And that is something, again, that we all need to be alert to is people being effectively made homeless again without those steps having been taken through. But I suspect that's going to be a developing area as we go through this year. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I shall uh, pass on to um, Suzanne. Okay, thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. Is that good, David? You can hear me? Good. Okay. Okay, hopefully I'll be able to move this on now. Lovely, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I recognise that I have got um, only a, a kind of a limited amount of time to uh, to speak. But what I think is quite useful is that um, while we've been talking about what's been going on in court, one of the areas that I've been working with providers on is what is actually happening, you know, kind of in the services, in the supported housing services, and as a result of us not being able to go to court. So. One of the things that I thought would be useful is if I just talk about what we mean by supported housing, because it is an umbrella term for a wide range of housing provision and how that is defined really depends on who you're talking to. So what we've got is a, um, a quite a wide spectrum of provision from registered care to visiting peripatetic support. So it includes a lot of the kind of um, actually interestingly the provision that um, that would be available for the people that Zia was was mentioning about kind of people who are currently being accommodated in roofs, you know, um, because they have been um, experiencing rough sleeping. 
would often come into an, uh, you know, kind of some element of supported housing. And the landlords can also be quite, um, quite wide, quite wide ranging in terms of local authority housing associations, charities and private landlords. But essentially it's schemes where housing and support and sometimes care are provided as a package of services. And the difficulty that we have with that is that we are often um, impacted by a kind of a plethora of legislation. So some of our arrangements do fall under the Protection from Eviction Act. Um, some of them fall under the relevant housing acts. We've got tenancies, we've got licenses, we've got different types of tenancies. We have got different types of licenses. But as we um, navigate through this maze of the agreements that people are on, um, there is no recognition of supported housing as a distinct sector. And what is true to say is that we do have um, probably more than average Human Rights and Equality Act challenges in the, in the work that we do. So that's something that actually we're, we're um, probably, actually probably I feel be quite sometimes better equipped at managing because we tend to do the um, PSED duties at a much earlier stage whilst we're looking at um, Whilst we're looking at removing, you know, kind of looking at um, the, the requirement to remove somebody from their current accommodation. This is also further complicated because a significant amount of provision isn't actually managed by the owning landlords. So there is a relationship. Obviously, the legal relationship is between the landlord and the person who's living there. But what we often find is there are management um, arrangements that enable the organisation best equipped to um, provide um, housing services and provide support and care services to that individual. So it's usually some sort of contract that dictates that. So our challenges of the legal framework are that we have, we do have significant numbers of um, services who have vulnerable people living in quite close proximity and we're walking a tightrope between individuals human rights, security of tenure and our, our, our duties of care and that's become even more I think highlighted whilst we've been within lockdown because we do house higher number of occupants with disabilities and vulnerabilities so we've got individuals enduring mental health, learning disabilities, substance misuse, young people, older people, and a wide spectrum of law that applies to the work that we do from unfair contract terms through to data protection, um, homelessness. We're not legal experts, however, and I have to say, if you're looking at supported housing, often that we do come across as the poor relations in housing provider terms. So, Dave asked me to come and speak about some of the implications of lockdown. So the first thing that I did is really put, put word out to the sector and said, what, you know, kind of what are you experiencing? And I was actually um, surprised with the, you know, kind of the immediate response. Now, maybe that's because we're all um, stuck, in our, you know, stuck in front of a screen. But I have actually had quite considerable response from providers who provide domestic violence services, mental health services, older people services, young people services, um, alcohol misuse, substance misuse, etc. So it is quite interesting about, you know, some of, the, some of the things I'm going to be talking about are actually common to the range of services provided. But some of the things I want to talk about is the stay and possession hearings and the new rules about notices in the Coronavirus Act 2020, enforcing social distancing social and um, self-isolation, managing antisocial behaviour, um, inability to move clients on. What I won't have time to talk about but has come up repeatedly is um, lack of personal protective equipment for the, um, for the staff who, who work in housing and some of the guidance for staff to, to enable them to continue to provide housing services but also support and care services and landlords maintenance responsibilities. So one of the things that we um, providers have fed back is there is, with the stay on possession hearings and the new notice periods, there has been a misunderstanding for excluded license agreements. So we've had um, intelligence from refuges, from refuges, intelligence from hostels, 
where particularly those that are being managed on behalf of um, the owning landlords is that they are there has been an edit edit stating that there should be um, there should be no evictions under any circumstances and a concern about that because what we're doing is dealing with situations where people are um, vulnerable themselves but in you know very close proximity to other people who are vulnerable and they're then continuing to remain in that property will threaten and um, could cause harm to the other people who are remaining in the property. So there's been an inability to enforce the occupancy agreement. So that, that's from kind of two sides. That's what, what is being fed back is that um, when people are going for advice, they are being advised to remain in their property. When, that's, um, when that is um, clearly not the best option for them, but clearly not the best option for those around them. Um, also, within legal terms, with excluded license agreements, there, there is the ability for the landlord to give that person reasonable notice and no requirement to go to court. So the stay on possession hearing should not affect that at all. We're also having some confusion in notice periods for those arrangements where, which are on licenses, where in terms of those licenses, they are under the Protection from Eviction Act, but they are licenses. So the, the um, clients are being advised that their landlord has to give them the extended notice period where that isn't actually the case. What I talk to providers about is that there is now reliance on injunctions, but they, they say for, you know, kind of injunctions are expensive. They are um, um, more complex for those providers to rely on. So they are going to court, they are gaining injunctions, but it is at a, at, at a great cost. And, um, but it isn't all negative. And some of the very positive stories that I heard coming through is um, some of the more alternatives for rent arrears, um, looking at, um, you know, kind of um, new ways of working in terms of managing rent arrears. Um, and only actually, pursuing any sort of more formal action will only be pursued where clients are not engaging, where they are not, are not eligible for any support and cannot pay the rent themselves. So what has come up though, and this, this is quite interesting, is in terms of enforcing lockdown measures. And I think this is one of the areas where we're seeing kind of some conflicting, you know, some, some conflicts in, in the legislation in that, in terms of lockdown, it's schemes where visitors are now prohibited, such as extra care and care homes. Um, and that's been leading to staff um, experiencing quite aggressive um, responses from visitors, but visitors actually making complaints of human rights violations and actually deprivation of liberty for that individual, particularly where the care home is, is stating that they are, you know, that people have to remain in their rooms or if they're symptomatic or people remaining in the room if they're, you know, as much as possible if they're, if they're shielding. So we have got other incidents where, but actually, interestingly, some providers did come back to me saying this isn't as widespread as we feared, but residents who are symptomatic in a shared housing provision refusing to isolate. And I think the one thing we'd say about shared housing is this really isn't the same as, um, you know, households, you know, I think, I think what some of the government guidance is, you know, is, is this to be treated as a, you know, kind of the individuals who all live there to be treated as a household, but that's actually becomes quite complex because generally households choose to live with each other. Whereas what we're, what we have in shared housing is where people have their own room and, um, are sharing the communal areas with others. And so it's, it's become difficult in terms of how we manage where we aren't able to enforce the occupancy agreement, where people are, are refusing to, to self-isolate or refusing to, um, you know, refusing to carry out some quite basic things in relation to the communal areas in terms of um, washing hands and things like that. Um, we've got um, residents who are um, sneaky visitors into shared housing provision and also um, not 
knowing what to do where residents visit family and friends and then are coming back into a shared housing provision. So these are some of the things that uh, providers are dealing with and they're dealing with that in the context of residents feeling quite um, um, anxious about living with other people who aren't, um, you know, who aren't taking lockdown measures. We are seeing an increase in antisocial behaviour. Now, it's interesting in the mental health services, they're talking about that increase is, you know, due to the fact, you know, it's kind of a two pronged, is that people being contained. Um, and so the anxiety around, around being contained, the anxiety around the virus, et cetera, but also where statutory services, where they've got staff in statutory services shielding, where you've got staff within the supported housing provision services having to shield themselves or having, or having to remain in their homes to shield um, family members, et cetera. So there is a reduction in resources and that is, it, it is manifesting itself in sometimes quite aggressive, violent and challenging behaviour. Difficulties in accessing local authority homelessness services, strain on statutory services. And I'm, you know, I'm, what I need to probably say here is that we haven't, you know, we haven't got any answers for this. And, you know, rather than asking for questions, sometimes my uh, response at the end of a presentation is, is ask for any answers that people might have, because these are things that we're trying to manage from a pragmatic perspective. And I think one of the difficulties is, is that we have, a whole range of measures that we're having to enforce without um, the one sanction that we have about being able to um, being able to utilize the occupancy agreement to manage some of this behavior. Um, move on is only happening in an emergency and there is a concern about not being able to enforce the terms of the um, agreement about how do we keep our clients safe in terms of our duty of care for them. What I have, what I think is, is quite interesting is that the, um, the government in Wales has actually produced some really good guidance about for supported housing providers. And I was reading through that the other day. And, you know, a lot of this is about statutory agencies and voluntary sector and housing association, supportive housing providers working together. And I think that would be a very good model for us to look at. And unfortunately, this doesn't seem to be happening. And what does seem to happen when statutory services and um, voluntary services and housing association services are under strain, we tend to blame each other in terms of uh, rather than, you know, kind of often getting kind of good working protocols. So I'm really pleased that w Wales has come up with something. Um, People talked about the inability to access move on and that is that 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 is going to create its own problems, particularly where we have a situation where the um, current accommodation for people who are of sleeping has come to an end, as Ia was saying. Um, actually, what has happened is some of the provision that would be available for those individuals to move on to has become silted up. So clients who ne whose needs can't be met by services, pregnant women in shared housing have been advised by the local authority to remain where they are. Um, clients ready to move on, but not able to do. Um, clients requiring more specialist services, substance misuse, mental health, or remaining with their requirements in provision. And services that have been decommissioned, they're talking about not being able to move clients on. It's been, I think, even more of a whistle-stop tour than, um, than the other speakers, I'm afraid. I, I seem to have the ability to talk very, very quickly. Um, Dave did actually say, what, what do you envisage life to look like after lockdown? And I think for sure we are going to see an increase in possession actions for renteries and for antisocial behaviour. I think we are just um, delaying some of these things. I think we are going to see an increase in, in homelessness um, as, as a result of, of the virus and a result of um, the impacts of lockdown. I think we are going to have a time lag where I think there's certain people who would ordinarily be able to access provision aren't going to be able to do because it's been so difficult for us to move people on. But what I would like to do is to end on a positive note which is that we, you know, like anything else, have found new ways of working. We're all on Zoom now, or Teams, etc. But we have found new ways of managing 
agreements and new ways of managing breaches. I think we've always been very good for, in our sector, in the supported housing sector, in the social housing sector, about um, managing to accommodate changes. And I don't see this being any different. And we have found, you know, some excellent new ways of working. Thank you. And for that, I'm going to now hand back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so either our speakers were incredibly clear and concise and to the point and left no room for doubt whatsoever as to what their opinions were, um, or perhaps you're all just tired and have had enough webinars, I don't know. Um, but in any event, we don't have any questions. So if it's the latter and you are sitting there eating your banana bread later on and you think to yourself, actually, I really wish that I had asked this question, please, by all means, get in touch with us, send us an email, um, either straight into Chambers or to Zia or to David. Uh, I'm not sure I can help you, but I, I will try if, if anyone wants to direct a question to me. Um, but uh, but I, I think that, that that is it and that is, there's no further questions. Um, we will see you at our next webinar or perhaps uh, more accurately, you will see us at our next uh, webinar. And uh, that just remains for me to say thank you and goodbye. <laughs>